Hello and welcome back to the shack. Today we're going to take a look at this HAL ST6 radio teletype terminal unit and see if we can't get it working. I bought this terminal unit from another ham in known non-working condition. So we'll take a look and see if we can't figure out what's going on. I think I have an idea uh, and whether we can get it working and get it on the air. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the, the features here um, in, in the beginning. We may talk about them a little as we work on it. But basically this is a mid-1970s to early 1980s terminal unit with all of the fancy features that you would have expected from that time period. Um, it handles wide and narrow RIDI. It has a limiter that can be turned in and out. It has motor control and an automatic uh, marking on the loop so that the terminal doesn't hammer when there's no signal. It has various indicators, tuning. It has its own loop, uh, current generator, things like that. Now this is an anachronistic unit for my Model 28 teletype. This would have been 30 years newer than the Model 28, which came out in the early 1950s. But until I get a, an early 60s-ish terminal unit to match the rest of my station, I'm going to use this unit, which should be a higher quality, easier to use unit on the air than the ST5000 that I'm currently using. So let's turn it around, take a quick look at the back, and then we'll open it up and see inside. Here's the back of the unit. We can see the plug here where the teletype would plug in so that it can be powered down when there's no signal. Potentiometer to control the loop current. Unlike the ST5000, this does have a configurable loop current. The ST5000 uses a different mechanism to keep it at uh, approximately 60 milliamps. The terminal itself would plug in right here. It has an output uh, RS-232 level, nominal plus 15 to minus 15 volt output for keying a computer or something like that. Uh, some audio controls, things like that, uh, and a control here for a narrow CW offset with which you can use a hand key to key your call sign. That is no longer an FCC requirement, but it was uh, around the time that this unit was originally designed. So we'll pull the cover off. You can see I've already got the screws out, and we'll take a look and see what's inside it. Here's the inside of the unit. We're looking at it from the rear. This is the rear panel that we were just looking at. Here's the front panel with the top of the meter just visible in the top of the frame. And this is typical construction for the time. It has a number of daughter boards that plug into sockets and point-to-point -point wiring to the controls uh, on the front of the unit and between the daughter boards. Here on the left of the chassis uh, from the rear, we have the power supply. This transformer provides the power both for the loop and for the low voltage components. We have the power supply board right here with the, the uh, DC rectifiers, filter capacitors, and things like that. And then past that, we have uh, here these two boards provide some of the logic and sensing for the uh, auto start motor control and things like that in the middle. To the right of that, towards the right of the chassis, we have the filter boards for 170 hertz offset and 850 hertz offset. And then here we have the limiter uh, and the uh, associated circuitry for doing uh, FM detection of the incoming RIDI signal. So the first thing you may notice here is that the power supply board over here is pointed to the left while the other boards in the chassis are pointed to the right. And that is correct orientation. You can even see that the person who I believe probably built this, I believe this was a kit built unit from the quality of the soldering job and some of the routing and things like that, has marked the frame, I'm not sure if it's visible well in the video, with the number of the board and the direction that the board should be plugged in for each place. When I received this unit, this power supply board was plugged in in the same direction as all of the other boards in the chassis. And this socket does not prevent that and in fact does make contact when the board is plugged in in that configuration. I believe that this is likely what the original problem was with this unit, is that someone had taken it apart, put it back together, and plugged this board in backwards. It does have a blown fuse here in the power supply unit, and there's even a tag on it that says that the fuse is bad, a 250 milliamp fuse on one of the low voltage supplies. Um, I believe that that probably is due to plugging this power supply in backwards, although I don't know that. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pull all the boards out of here. We're going to take all the electrolytic capacitors that are in here, and there are quite a few, and replace them with replacements that I've purchased. They're in bags up there uh, from DigiKey. 
um, and see if we can't get this guy back uh, working in that fashion just by going through the whole thing front to back. Uh, first thing I'll do is, is fix up the power supply board, put it in, and we'll go from there. I do have a manual for this, and because this was available in a kit form, the manual does indicate how to go through and test each part of this as you build it. We'll probably go through those procedures in trying to determine what the problem with this guy might be. So the first thing we'll do is we'll pull all these boards out. There are a couple of filter capacitors down here on the line that I'm going to replace with some uh, XY rated safety capacitors first thing. We'll wring some things out and then we'll uh, start replacing capacitors on this board on these boards and see if we can't bring this guy back to life. Here we have the filter capacitors that I was talking about on the incoming line cord. And as you can see from these terminal solder jobs, this is part of what makes me believe that this was probably a kit. Or perhaps this line cord was replaced at some time, but the same cord is used in other places in the chassis, so I'm kind of doubting uh, that that was the case. I think this was probably a kit. Um, but at any rate, these capacitors here that are across, they're basically from each phase to ground, uh, to earth on the line cord, to the, to the um, third pin, are just regular ceramic capacitors, which was typical of that era. But now uh, we use what we call safety capacitors in, in these places, and they're capacitors that should they fail, will fail open rather than failing shorted, so they should be a little bit safer for us, particularly because this chassis is grounded to that third pin. And if you should lose the third pin ground, the safety ground, uh, and one of these capacitors, then you can have 110 volts uh, on, this, on the chassis, which, which we do not want. So we're going to go ahead and uh, pull those capacitors out of there, replace them with safety capacitors, clean up these ugly solder jobs, and then we'll be right back. So I've replaced the safety capacitors in the chassis uh, and resoldered that line cord, and now we're looking here at the power supply board on which I've started replacing some of the electrolytic capacitors. And there's a couple things I want to show you here. One is, this is a replacement uh, electrolytic capacitor. Replace this giant guy right here. Uh, and this replacement capacitor, if you'll notice, it has two little holes in the board beside it. And that's because if we look at the other side of the board, there are three holes in a row, one here, one here, and one here for that particular capacitor. And I don't know if that's because of electrolytic sourcing at the time in general, or because this was a kit. I suspect probably because it was a kit, uh, that allowed them to source different capacitors or the, the builder to source different capacitors to place in there. And depending on the radial spacing of the leads, they could place their capacitor on the board uh, with no trouble. Another thing I want you to notice is, and if I bring this closer, it'll be obvious, the amount of flux that's left on this board. And that's not good because flux is an organic active uh, chemical and it will damage things over time. And this board has had several decades of flux soaking on it. And I don't know, it is, it's, it's obvious there if you can see, but this pad lifted up when I was replacing that capacitor. Now there was a lot of solder on this joint, which meant that there was a lot of heat in there to remove the solder to get that joint uh, cleaned up. And that can lift traces from boards, particularly these older boards. But with the amount of flux that was left around this joint, I suspect that the flux had had time over those decades to eat in underneath that pad and loosen the traces from this board. So that's something you wanna watch, particularly when you're building a kit. And particularly when it has large joints like these, uh, with, with these large pads, wipe that flux up when you're done. You can just use regular old household isopropyl alcohol to do that. This is just pharmacy isopropyl alcohol. And you put a little bit on a uh, Q-tip or a paper towel or something and just wipe these joints up. You can see I've started uh, as I've gone along and cleaned up these joints a little bit. Uh, to, to get some of that flux off of there. And uh, you can also probably see the, some of the old flux is still on there. After these decades, it's very hard to get that off. It's, for, it's, uh, it's mechanically hard uh, and it chips off of there, but it doesn't want to just wipe off of there. So clean your flux off your boards and it'll help prevent things like this happening if you ever have to do rework or, or look at the board again down the line. So it turns out that I am missing, I didn't order uh, a replacement for this capacitor, which as you can see is a 100 uh, microfarad. MFD was used for microfarad in these older capacitors, 250 volt capacitor. I don't have one of these, so I ordered one from DigiKey. We'll get that in and I'll replace that. 
Uh, in the meantime, I still have to replace this capacitor on this board. Uh, again, it was it was uh, this is a replacement for a capacitor just like this. Uh, I'll replace that one. I've replaced these two back here already. When this comes in, I'll replace it. In the meantime, we'll take a look at some of the other boards uh, and see if there's anything we can do to get them going. So I was replacing capacitors on these various boards and I got to this board, which was the one on the far right uh, in the chassis as it was sitting when we looked at it before. And I was looking at it and I said, this does not look uh, like a limiter board, which is what I said it had been. And I looked it up and this is a HAL XTK100 uh, and it turns out that this was not one of the original boards in the ST6. This is a later edition, uh, and the HAL bus allows that. It allows boards to be added later. And this board is uh, an AFISC oscillator for transmit. The original HAL ST6 did not have transmit oscillators. It was only a receiving terminal unit, and you would use external oscillators uh, on your loop for transmitting. So uh, this is uh, the, the oscillator for the transmit, and I had misidentified it um, before. The limiting and motor control uh, are performed by these uh, other two middle boards that, that we uh, looked at before. So as you can see, I've replaced the caps on quite a few of these boards. I'm uh, continuing apace, and uh, we'll get the last couple of the cap capacitors replaced here. Uh, that remain on these boards and then we will uh, start testing this thing. Okay, uh, it's been a few days. I got all my parts in. I've replaced all of the capacitors on all of these boards, in particular the capacitors on this power supply board, which are the ones that are most likely to do real damage to the system because they run directly across the, the various power rails for, for filtering. So a, a large amount of current could pass through them. Um, if they were to leak substantially or, or fail open. Um, this capacitor here in particular is the um, capacitor across the current loop supply, and so it has about 175 volts across it, and so we want to make sure that that guy doesn't fail. Uh, so they've all been replaced. All these capacitors have been replaced. Uh, th as I said, throughout the entire unit. I also replaced, uh, if it's visible here, the two capacitors here on the incoming line cord with safety capacitors um, so that the, the, if they fail, that they will not fail open, that they will fail closed. Uh, or I'm sorry, that they will not fail closed, that they will fail open. Um, and, uh, and I've tested some things out. I powered some things up. Things were looking good. Now, unfortunately, I have had a setback. If you see here, there are no fuses in this board. Um, there are no fuses in this position. This is where the um, current loop fuse goes. And while I've been working on this, except when I was checking the current loop, I've been leaving this fuse out, which limits the high voltage in this supply to the primary side uh, of the transformer here uh, for with the 120 volt line voltage and to the wiring leading to the input to this fuse, but there is no additional high voltage anywhere past that in this chassis, in particular not on these upper exposed terminals on this uh, potentiometer on the back. I just feel like that makes it a little bit safer to, to work in. However, these fuses are missing. Uh, these are one, oh, I'm sorry, 250 milliamp fuses on the positive and negative supply rails because I blew them. Um, and they were blown, I believe I know why, we'll talk about that in a second, but they were blown after some substantial successful testing of the unit. Things were working, the, the filters were correctly demodulating, I was getting marks and spaces, etc. But then when I tried to uh, activate the uh, actual uh, decoding reception, turn on the auto start circuit, the motor circuits and things like that, uh, those fuses blew. And I believe that is due to this board right here, uh, which as you can see uh, on the back is labeled as the auto start and anti-spacing board. The anti-spacing was uh, working, auto start was not. And I have removed uh, this LM709 op amp from this board because it shows only about 75 ohms between its non-inverting input uh, and the negative voltage rail. I believe it's the non-inverting input. It's uh, pin four and the uh, negative voltage rail. This has a positive uh, 12 volt and a negative 12 volt voltage applied to it. 
Um, and, and those inputs in the absence of any other input on the chip should show high impedance to the power supply rails. And so this thing is, is allowing a fair amount of current to pass through it um, when it is just sitting there uh, idle. And uh, what that causes is when this chip is in place and this board is inserted in the chassis and any of the auto start functions are enabled, um, then there's only about 118 ohms between the positive 12 volt and the negative 12 volt uh, rail. And uh, if you do the math there, that's a fair amount of my 250 milliamp total current budget just passing through this, this chip in its, in its idle uh, condition. And I believe the other stuff uh, here in the chassis then uh, makes up enough for that 250 milliamps to be exceeded and I in fact blow uh, the fuses. That's my working hypothesis this, at this point. We will see uh, if that's the case because what we're going to do next is we're going to do a little bit of testing. So rather than use this power supply and the power supply board here, I have some more fuses on order. I in fact don't have two more 250 milliamp fuses to put in here. So we're going to set this board aside and what we're going to do is, is find where the power outputs are on this board. They're in this area. We'll look up exactly where they are. I have the schematics. Uh, right here um, and we're going to feed positive 12 volts and negative 12 volts from a current limited supply directly into the frame here so that we can probe around and figure out what else is going on. Now I also do not have a replacement op amp for this guy just yet. I have put it on order. The 709 is an obsolete part. Um, they have not been uh, you see here, it's. Uh, uh, I'm guessing that is a probably an 81, a 1981 part. I'm not sure. That's not a traditional four-digit uh, date code. Um, but at any rate, they're obsolete. They have not been produced in quite some time. They were replaced by the LM741, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, the LM741 is not quite 100% pin compatible with the 709, although uh, it can be replaced uh, successfully in many instances. However, I was able to find some LM LM709 uh, replacement devices uh, on eBay for about a dollar a piece. So I ordered a passel of those. Uh, there's probably 10 of them in this in total or, or maybe more. This has some uh, 4000 series logic on it, uh, this AFISC board, but almost all of the other chips or maybe all of the other chips on these other boards are uh, 709 op amps. So I've ordered replacement op amps. We'll get that put in there uh, when that comes in. But in the meantime, I wanna check these rails and make sure that I don't have other shorts while I'm here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, as I said, get out a current limited supply, put it directly on the plus 12 and minus 12 volt rails and look for uh, that 100 milliamp current limit to be exceeded. Uh, I'm sorry, the 250 milliamp current limit to be uh, exceeded. And uh, if it is, then we'll try to keep probing and, and figure out where that is. So let's get this, this thing hooked up and get checking. I wanted to back up and talk about how I actually found the problem with this board and this power supply. I didn't go through the whole troubleshooting process because these videos are already too long, but I do want to let you know sort of what happened and, and how it happened uh, in case that's helpful. And so, of course, the first thing that I did was I checked the power supply. And of course, this is the power supply board. We've seen it before. And it has capacitors that I had to replace, it has a number of diodes on it, a couple of transistors, etc. But basically what I did is I replaced the capacitors and then I checked the diodes, put it in this machine without the power turned on, and then checked the impedance of the various power supply rails. And there are four rails here that we're interested in. There's a negative 20, a negative 12, a 12, and a 20 volt rail. Um, and so I, I put the board in, uh, oriented in the correct fashion, uh, check the impedance to the chassis in between the rails, then powered the thing up and check the voltages on the rails and they were all okay, which eliminates this, or at least makes it unlikely that this is the problem uh, with the frame. So then of course I took this out and with that out of here, I started checking impedances on the rails with the other boards in. And what I found very quickly was that the negative 12 volt rail showed about 118 ohms to the chassis. Uh, and I've put the bad um, op amp back in this board 
and if we get the probe on there you'll see that the negative 12 volt rail which is what I'm probing right now uh, shows 117.71 ohms uh, to the chassis which is not in itself necessarily a problem but the fact that for example the positive 12 volt rail uh, shows about one and a half K to the chassis leads us to believe that that may be an anomalous value. There's nothing in this circuit that led me to believe that the negative 12 volt rail should be doing a lot of work compared to the positive 12 volt rail. So then in order to isolate what board was the problem here, I basically took probe that line, uh, took a clip, clipped this onto a line somewhere convenient here in the chassis and started pulling the boards out. And what I found is that when I pulled this board out of the chassis, that that impedance rose significantly. So what I'm gonna do here is I am going to place a probe on that negative 12 volt rail. And we see it has 100, about 118 ohms on it, and I'm gonna pull this board out. And when I do that, you can see that the impedance in the chassis goes to about eight and a half kilo ohms, which says, hey, you know, maybe this board is the problem. So then the next thing I did was I put this board back in took the other boards out one at a time, and then also checked the impedance from negative 12 to the chassis to make sure that this board wasn't just showing uh, the problem, but the problem might have been somewhere else. Say this connected some wires together or something that caused it to show up. So let's see what that looks like now. So now with all of the other boards out of the chassis, if we go ahead and we probe that same line, we see that we have uh, about 118 ohms. It changed a little bit because there were some other items on that power rail, but that leads us to believe that this board is probably uh, the culprit. So then the next thing I did was I just went and I looked at the schematic because I have the schematics for this unit. And I looked at the schematic. This is the board uh, inside this box. I started with the negative 12 volt rail, which is marked right here on uh, finger K on the edge connector. And I started working my way across here from the finger K to see which of these items might have been shorting the rail. And the first thing I noticed is that we have here uh, a couple of transistors that go basically from the negative 12 to the positive 12 volt rail. And there's a diode on this one and a resistor on this one. Uh, but these could have been the problem if something had gone south along the way. So I checked those uh, and um, they, uh, I, I pulled the chips off. I checked those, these checked okay. Uh, and then so I started putting chips on and checking. And of course this was the very next one I got to. I stuck it in there, I checked it, and I saw that my problem would come back. So then I took this chip out of the frame or out of the, off of the board and actually probed the pins on the chip. And that's when I found that this pin five to pin six here had a low impedance connection. And pin five here, uh, and, and looking at the schematic here, I believe I said before that it was the non-inverting input, but that's, that may be the inverting input. Um, I have to look at the data sheet. Um, but this pin here, pin five, um, should be a very high impedance input, uh, actually at all times, but certainly when the chip is quiescent. Uh, and so that indicates that there's probably a problem uh, with this op amp. And of course, by pulling it, replacing it with another op amp, we could demonstrate that that is in fact the problem. Uh, and this chip was the problem, as we saw with our current limiting power supply, which showed that it was going into current limit, which is when the fuse would have blown. So basically, that's how I found the problem. I uh, just probed the rails um, because that's something you should do when you bring something up that's blowing fuses. Uh, I probed the rails. I found a suspiciously low impedance uh, point on one of the power rails and then sort of moved through the frame and then through the schematic to find the part. All right, it took a minute, but we're set up here. I've had to rearrange the bench a little bit to get another piece of test kit put in here, uh, which is this uh, tech unit down here, which has a current limited power supply over here that's set to plus 12 and minus 12 volts, each at 250 milliamps which is exactly what this board that was the original board in the unit uh, was providing. Uh, it is wired in right here onto this card, onto the plus 12 and minus 12 rails. Uh, the power supply board, obviously I was just waving around, is not in the unit. Um, and the ground for that power supply passes through this meter 
which is set up as a uh, milliamp meter, passes through that meter and to a jack uh, on the back of this to the chassis ground. Uh, I have this an oscilloscope probe hooked to the audio frequency input back here. I have an oscilloscope probe hooked to the limiter output uh, up here. And then this voltmeter probe, the negative is, is on the back of the chassis, uh, same as the, the milliamp meter. And we can probe around here and check our voltages uh, wherever it is that we want to check them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and power up that power supply. We'll see how much current draw we have there. Um, and then we will inject some signals into the unit uh, and see what we get um, as far as the, the limiter output. Now I'm not quite sure what functionality we will and won't have here since I did pull that op amp. We can stick that op amp back in uh, and see if it changes anything, although it certainly is, is not right. It's not working. So let's power this thing up. Uh, looks like we're drawing about 75 milliamps there. I see nothing on the scope, nothing changed on the scope, uh, which is correct. There, there's no input coming in right now. Um, but let's, uh, let's give it some input and, and see what happens. Okay, uh, we're giving it some input through FL Digi. Um, and this is dancing a little bit on the scope. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, because the signal does have the start and stop bits uh, at the beginning end of the signal. It's sending blanks, uh, which is all spacing, but then it does have the, the start bit, which is a mark, and so it'll dance a little bit. Uh, and that's what we're seeing on the screen, is the, the sort of continuous space um, tone there occasionally being uh, replaced by a mark, which, which throws the sync off a little bit, in this sine wave right here. And then the truncated sign there is the output of this um, limiter circuit right here. So, or I'm sorry, it's not in limiting mode right now. It's in, it's in AM mode right now. The signal going in the back is a little hotter than we ideally would like, um, but that's what I have uh, right now to put in it. The sound card that I'm using does not have a, uh, a mixer on board. In fact, if we go to limit, we may see... Yep, that those uh, that that truncated sine wave does in fact become a square wave, uh, so the limiter is working. So uh, with this set up like this, we should be able to probe and test on this unit and see if we can figure out what was going on, and what is going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to power down the um, power supply over here. I'm going to put the bad chip back in. And we're going to play with some of these front panel switches and see if we can't get it into a current limit mode, which would be where my fuse blew before. Be right back. Okay, uh, so let's power this thing up and see where we go. Yeah, you can already see that the negative rail there on the, see the flashing red light? This flashing red light indicates that the negative rail is, is going into overcurrent. So we only see a net current flow uh, on the milliamp meter of 100, negative 100 milliamps there. Um, but that's probably because the remainder of the 150 plus milliamps is being synced into the, the positive supply. Uh, so let's shut this off before we do any more damage. Okay, so what I've done here is I have removed the 850 hertz tone boards from this unit because we're not currently uh, using the 850 hertz uh, shift. We're set to 170 up here, so I can pull these out. They're not doing anything. Um, and I have placed one of the 709 op amps from the 850 hertz tone boards uh, onto this board so that we have a complete set of op amps on here. So now I am going to power up this unit and see one of two things is likely to happen here. Either there's a problem in this board or in the setup that's going to cause this op amp to go south, in which case it's a good thing I have 15 of them on order, uh, or we should see that the current limit does not go over limit on the power supply and hopefully things look good. We still have a signal coming into the board here. I'm going to go ahead and power it on see what happens. So no overlimit. Things look good. Now, what got me into trouble last time when this problem uh, occurred was I came over here and I tried to use some of the auto start features over here. 
Uh, I put it in um, slow detection for um, uh, valid signal, and I flipped on the, the two auto start switches, uh, and we had trouble. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take it out of standby, put on slow detection, turn on auto start, turn on the motor switch. So, so far so good. Uh, things seem to be working. Oh, I note that the motor relay back here is not pulled in, um, and that is a little confusing to me. But it is the case. Um, now, I'm not sure. We're not providing all of the voltages that this requires. There's positive and negative 20 volt rails as well, although I believe they're only used for these front panel lamps. Yeah, the power switch really shouldn't do anything at this point. Uh, I believe they're only used for these front panel lamps, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure why that's not pulling in. I would expect uh, we have a, a fairly strong signal reading on the meter here. I would expect that motor uh, control to have pulled in. But we will we'll debug that later. At this point, I think I would consider this a successful test. I think we can be pretty confident that that 709 there um, is was the problem. It was what was blowing the fuses originally. It was not just that the board was put in backwards. That 709 was blowing the fuses, um, and it may have been causing some functional errors as well. So we'll wait for those 709s to come in. Um, we'll replace that. We'll get all these boards put back together. Uh, we'll get this power supply put in. I have fuses on order as well. Uh, we'll get this power supply put in, and then we'll see if we can't work from there. Okay, we've made some good progress, and I think this is where we're going to stop for this video. As you can see, the unit is now successfully receiving an incoming ready signal. We have a good signal level here on the meter. We have mark and space flashing, and it appears the reception is uh, correct. Now, unfortunately, there are still some problems. We're not done. For one thing, this motor relay is, I, I believe before I thought it was not pulled in, but it is in fact pulled in at all times, whether or not a signal is being received. And when a motor is plugged into the loop, it stops uh, receiving. Or, I'm sorry, when a teletype is plugged into the loop, it stops receiving here. It stops trying to decode. So there are still some more things to debug, but certainly we have fixed the power supply circuit. We have fixed the short that we had over here, got some recapping done, and some sort of functionality is in place. So uh, we'll call it quits for now, and then hopefully you'll join me next time when we try to figure out uh, how to correct the decoding problems when there's a teletype in the loop and how to get the motor control working correctly. Thanks for watching.